got a real, I got this great new boot for the soldiers. This boot is much better than the other boot. Um, in fact, it's three or four percent more comfortable than the boots they're now wearing. What? I'm fighting a major enemy. I got hundreds of thousands of soldiers in the field. Are you talking to me about boots? Come on. You know, I need to deal with information that's valuable. Well, in politics, it's the same thing. Polls are expensive. They're actually a lot cheaper here than in most countries, but it's still expensive. So I want to get value from this survey that I can use. If it's two years before an election, and I want to get some sense of which way the country's going, I just kind of need to know they're going, it's this way. I don't need to know the difference between this and this two years before an election. I just kind of need to know the difference between this and this. Which means that my margin of error <coughs> doesn't have to be small. And what does small margin of error mean? It means money. Because you've got to spend more money to get a larger set to buy a larger sample size. And larger sample size is the thing that produces a smaller margin of error. So think about it. what am I going to use this information for? Um, don't buy more than you need. Also, don't don't believe everything you're here. You're reading the paper. Let's go to the next slide here. Man. That that chart, by the way, which uh, does everyone have a copy of this? Yes. This makes the point that uh, Celinda made earlier about sample size. It may have been our friend from. Uh, Indonesia. No, it was Celinda talking about Montana. Is Montana still a state? <laughs> we like being country. Uh, uh, um, but Kadesh, interestingly enough, is the one place I have worked where the samples percentage of the universe actually has turned out to be important. Nowhere else in the world. I have worked, is this true? Now, why is this? I see you guys nodding your heads, but you don't actually know. And that's because we're, we're trying something now that has been tried here before um, called a parallel vote tabulation or a statistically based uh, observation. You've got a lot of polling stations, and we cannot put trusted observers, or we can't pay enough observers. Unfortunately, for statisticians, national total is meaningless. The popular vote in Bangladesh in a parliamentary election doesn't mean anything. The only thing that matters is the vote in each of the 300 constituencies, and each of them is first past the post, so you got to know pretty precisely what happened. The polling stations. We need to do a sample of every constituency in the country in order to do this parallel count. Well, if we had to do 100 polling stations in every constituency, that would be, what's 100 times 300, 30,000? That's too many. You don't have the volunteers for it. So several years ago, I took real data from a parliamentary election here, and I started doing some calculations on what sample size you would need to measure what happened in a single constituency? How many polling stations would you need to go to? And I used a lot of high-level statistics and talked to a lot of experts on what's called cluster sampling. And what it eventually showed was that there's an example where the formula, the actual formula on margin of error has as one of its components the percentage that the sample is of the universe, but it's not counted very much. It's only counted a little bit. But when you get down to small universe sizes, that little bit of counting begins to make a difference. Now, everything I just said, you probably did not know before I said it and you will probably forget it before I leave this room. But it's an example of why knowledge, real knowledge of statistics is so important to understanding how survey research really works. And you can't have that level of knowledge. Few of you might, 
But generally, in a political party, you can't have that level of knowledge, which means that you have got to, absolutely, beyond question, a, a certainty, if you're going to use political survey work for anything meaningful, you have to have an expert working with you that you trust and who really knows this stuff. And there are a lot of people out there, in the whole world and in Bangladesh as well, who claim to be expert in this and are not. And so what you need to do is to educate yourself at least to the point where you can identify who knows what they're talking about and who does not. Because this data is really important. And if you spend too much money buying data you don't need or buying data which is inaccurate, you've, you have, it's a self-inflicted wound. It's like, you know, we're fighting this war again. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. Um, so you got to get educated in this. Let's take a look. This, this slide right here shows an illustration of how as the sample size stays the same and the universe gets bigger, the margin of error doesn't change because the sample size is everything with some exceptions. But this is the reverse. It says if you want to get a certain margin of error, what kind of sample do you need? These are these are great. I keep I keep these two little graphs printed out in my desk. I don't have to memorize anything. I don't have to have any formulas in my head, other than a little tricky thing with square root of the sample divided into 100. But just keep those two. So the next time you have a conversation, you see something about sample, you can just get out and look. So when the newspaper says this margin of error is such and such. The sample size was this. You could look at that and say, "Wait a minute, that's not right." Okay. All right. Once you get beyond the very first step, which is figuring out how accurate your information has to be, you got to start thinking, as Celinda talked about, what are, what are you doing this for? What do you want to know? What's the what's the point of this information? What is it that you need to understand about your potential constituents that's important? And this can just be a quagmire because, as has been pointed out, the way you ask the question, the way you put that question in front of the respondent makes a huge difference to how they answer it. Um, Understanding the population to begin with. For example, in this country, if you were to do a random sample of the population and it turned out that your random sample produced back 60% women and 40% men, would that be right? Who knows? Depends on what the population is. If the population is 60 40, then it would be right. But in a lot of countries, Bangladesh included, the census is not necessarily accurate. So you get into a whole question. Which is more accurate? My sample, which has statistics behind it, or the census, which has the government behind it? And when was the census done? And who was it done by? And who pulled my sample? I'm, I'm trying to make this sound complicated purposely. Because it is. Every single question you encounter about what type of survey you want, who you want to ask what questions of, when are you going to do it, how are you going to do it. All of this is crucial, absolutely crucial to whether or not it's good information that you can use. And the standard way of going about this is to go to a political polling firm and say to them, we would like to do a survey. How much will that cost? And they say to you, uh, some number. If they give you a number without asking you a lot of questions, go to some other firm. They better ask you a lot of questions. Selinda pointed out in the conversations she has with her clients before they start. All the pieces of information that a pollster needs to know before they can make any judgment at all as to what type of survey and how complicated it is and how difficult. Um, 
We do a lot of survey work in Afghanistan. We have to do it door to door, much as you do surveys here. And there are some places in Afghanistan that are tough to get to. And they are even tougher once you get there. And you have people chasing you down the street trying to shoot you. So um, we do large samples, 9,000 people, 10,000 people. And that's because we know that a lot of those people we're not going to be able to get to. So all those surveys are interesting statistically. Back to statistics a second. 1,000 people. Random selection. We're going to go to 400 villages, and in each village we're going to ask two or three people, so we can ask 1,000. But the one village, they show up, and there was a flood. So, all right, we won't go to that village. Doesn't matter, it's only one. And another village they go to, uh, there's a Hartal, so we're not gonna go in there. Now, random selection says it's gotta be random. Nothing else, you can't be. I mean, that's part of the, you know, that's sort of, in, in Afghanistan, we got a real non-availability problem. Walk in there and the guy says, I'm sorry, I'm not going to this village. And we were only able to speak to two people that represent that 20%. So we're just gonna take their two answers and weight them up as if we talked to everybody we should have in that area. But right away, you can kind of see if you're supposed to talk to 100 people and you only talk to two, saying that the two represent the 100. It's got all kind of statistical problems associated with it, but it's done all the time. So, you know, that little two words, waiting trap. There are books written on those two words, many books. And you all sitting out there, we're going to have this, you know, one hour conversation. Again, you got to find somebody you know, trust, believe in. See, what, see what's happening next year. Question wording. Okay, um, tell me, which do you like better, um, red or tall? Red or tall? There are some questions like that. The respondent says, tall. So the survey reports back that most people like red and tall. So it's completely meaningless. Um, and, you know, um, there are, okay, the uh, gross national product of Bangladesh dropped by 13 basis points last year, and our direct foreign investment fell from 42 to 36 on the Kupin scale. So what do you think of our economic situation? That was meaningless. I just made all that up. I don't, most, of that, most of that wasn't even real terms. Um, but it sounded good. And you put a question like that together, the respondent's going to just doze off. And when they wake up, they're going to say something. But it's meaningless. Bad question. What we got? Dickie, Dickie told me 10 minutes ago that I had 10 minutes left. That was five minutes ago. Five minutes ago, okay. Here, here's the biggest problem with field work, where you're going out and doing door to door. See that person on the right? That's the person you're paying to be out there asking questions. He's sitting underneath the tree, taking a nap, and he's got his stack of survey forms. He's going to wake up from his nap, and he's going to start writing down answers because he knows he gets paid by the survey form. And he'll do all kinds of tricks. He'll write with his right hand, then write with his left hand. He'll, he'll try to randomly come up with answers. Human beings cannot do things randomly. You tell a human being to write down a random number string, like write down 100 numbers randomly. They cannot do it. The simplest computer program in the world could look at a string of numbers that were theoretically random as against those written by a person, and they'll pick out every single time the one written by a human. We do not think randomly. We introduce all matter of thinking into what we're doing. So that guy there, hopefully who's awake, 
And he goes to the village and says, was anybody out here asking questions? No. No. You sure there wasn't a guy with a hat on a few days ago? Oh yeah, there was a guy with a hat on. He slept under that tree right there. Um, but he didn't ask any questions. Or, yes, he was supposed to go to these six houses, but actually what he did was he went to the market and he asked a bunch of people in the marketplace what they thought, and he wrote down their answers. You know, that kind of she's hard to know. Comes in, looks like of the clusters we go into. 30% we find the guy underneath the tree. Um, what's another slide say? I don't know why I put that there. This one. <laughs> I don't know. Well, quick, skip that. <laughs> um, statistics. You can get a doctorate in statistics. You can do postdoctoral work in statistics. You can keep learning statistics for your whole life. It is a real quasi science. Quasi science. That's because statistics is all theory. No one has ever been able to count everything or ask any everyone everything. It's all says most of the time, if you do it again, the same thing will happen. So it's all theories. And even given that it's theories, you can study the mathematics behind it. So, so when, you start, when you're dealing with political pulsers, Selena really pulled her punch when she was asked, how do most political pulsers get their training? Most of them don't have any training. <laughs> She's one of the few in this business who's actually trained, who actually understood what I was just talking about. Um, I got a lot of friends who are political pollsters who literally, literally would not have understood some of what I just said in the last hour, which is ridiculous, but nevertheless true. Um, so when it gets down to using advanced statistical methods, forget it. You're lucky if they, if they provide you with cross tabulations, which is just simply how many women thought this and how many men thought this, as opposed to how many of everybody thought something. You can use the data from any survey in extraordinary ways. You just have to think about how having that information would be helpful. And the wonderful thing about modern computers is that advanced statistical methods, which used to be labor intensive and difficult, can now be done in a snap. There's not even any cost to it. There's a cost to understanding what it all means. You gotta have someone who knows the field, but there is so much data laying inside of your uh, surveys, you just gotta have somebody who knows how to get it out of there, how to mine it, literally. Um, so, there's a lot of other stuff, um, but I think my major point is, don't try to become a statistician. Don't try to become a public opinion researcher. But learn enough to know what questions to ask and to understand whether or not the answers you're given make sense, whether or not the survey researcher you're about to hire seems to really understand their own field and is going to help you use it to defeat your political opponent because that's what it's for this this isn't about gossip this is about hard information for hard purposes and hard money is used to buy it so learn what you need to get what you're paying for We have about 10 minutes for question and answer. Uh, anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Still puzzled about the margin of error, I guess. <laughs> we'll be back all together shortly anyway, right? Yes. Let's just think about this a little bit. And ask some of them. Please. Oh, uh, yeah, I think we have questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you take a seat here if you want? Okay. 
Okay, the first one, uh, here and then the other one. I hate this because you just know that the first question I'm not going to know the answer to. <laughs> Please, ma'am. Um, thank you for giving a wonderful speech. Can you hear me? I, yeah. I can. Okay. Um, I was just wondering. Oh, perhaps um, the mic is not working. Yes. Yeah, I can hear you, but perhaps others cannot. Is it working? Yes, no, it's working. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering when you have the uh, when you have the election, you said you randomly select um, certain polling stations to do your uh, making a point about the margin of error is something called a parallel vote tabulation where what we are looking at is how the votes in that polling station were cast by the voters and how they were counted so for example if a polling station shows 60 40 as the result we want to be able to compare that with what's reported by the commission at the end of the day and we want to add up all of those votes from that district and make a projection as to who the winner should have been in that parliamentary district. So we're not asking anyone any questions. We're simply looking at the votes that were actually cast, not the individual ballots, because that would be a violation of freedom of voting and secret ballot, but we're looking at the vote total for the polling station. So when we have a sample, it is to measure the votes in that constituency, not the actions of individual voters. So you really don't know whether the voting that was casted, uh, who the parties it was voted for, correct? We do not know anything about what the individual voters did. We only know what the polling station acting as a whole did. Okay. How do you monitor when uh, the vote is being counted? And of course, there are polling agents sitting there, and the vote has been counted and counted for for each individual candidate. And then, when the TNO sends the report to the actual main polling station, it changes. How do you monitor that? Could everybody hear that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the question is about the tactics and techniques of election observation. And how do you know that the vote count you witness in the polling station is what ends up in Dhaka at the end yes. of the day? Not Dhaka. Well, you into the individual districts. Yeah. But re what, what the final report is. Yeah. There are two ways, really. One, you observe the count physically. Okay. If you cannot watch the count, if you cannot see the ballots being counted, the process does not work. And that does not mean I'm sitting here and you are looking at the vote down there. It means I can walk down right next to you and watch you take the ballot out of the box, look at it, you say it's for candidate A, and I watch you mark down candidate A, and then put the ballot aside. Then when they add all those up, I can watch them add them up, and at the end it shows 60 to 40, so I know at polling station number one, in constituency number 10, the vote was 60 to 40. And then when it is reported by the district, it should show at say 64. Okay, can I just say my experience? Sure. Okay. And then Do you have time we'll, for that? Yes, and then we'll give uh, okay. others to ask questions. I was in Borisha, okay? Uh, I shouldn't have been in one of those polling stations when they were counting, but they thought I was one of the IRI polling observers because they thought I was a partner, so I entered there, they invited me. So I sat with them when they counted it. Wonderful, the counting was done absolutely fine. And I jotted down the numbers. But unfortunately, when it was reported to the main headquarters, the numbers were not correct. Hence, when Borisha, when they were about to declare that it was not coming for BNP, I went in personally and discussed it. And I said, look, I've seen all these things, what's happened. So you know the results, what it is. To give us the result, what it is. And that is why Borishan was later on declared as being victory. Yeah, well, what you did was precisely what every good observer should do. The, the easiest way to maintain a check on the accuracy is to 
have polling station data publicly available on a national level. But it needs not done. I know. Illegal. No, it is. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I saw a raise of a pen on that table. Next questions? Question? There'll be another opportunity. Oh. Huh? One more and then, yes. <laughs> Okay, please, sir. Uh, I, I want to know how many real statistics did DI carry out in Bangladesh? Are there any uh, anyone which is renowned, which we don't know? Or is there anyone you should know about that you carried out this uh, survey and this was the result? Any of the highlights? Uh, I'm going to let Dickie answer that question because he's our director of research here. All right, so training, capacity development, however you want to call it. And of course, you know, when you learn to do something or improving your capacity to do something, the example I used to use is driving a car. You cannot uh, obtain the, the ability to drive a car by sitting in a room like this talking about research. Yes. So in addition to talking about this, talking about driving a car, the system, you have to drive an actual car with some help from somebody who knows. So that's what we're doing as well. We work with political parties in Bangladesh, uh, talk about the importance of research, the nuts and bolts, uh, the techniques, the statistics, this and that, and then we work with them uh, to do surveys as well. I think so far we have done uh, three national surveys. Uh, not and, and we we, uh, we share the results with the stakeholders, with the parties and people we work with. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Glenn. A big round of applause for the second hour. All right. Uh, so I'm gonna ask. Break. Okay, we're going to have five minutes break before we, we continue the next uh, session. We're going to start the Q&A session. So, throughout the day, we have uh, hear from our speakers. You know, in the beginning, Dr. Salahuddin has mentioned, uh, you know, the development of research for political parties in Bangladesh, followed by Mr. Kodari from Indonesia, who will tell us his personal journey that shows how uh, public opinion surveys and politics changes in Indonesia since the start of the reform era. And then followed by uh, Salinda, who share, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of surveys, and then Glenn with uh, a very elaborate explanation about research, margin of error, and we don't need to be an expert in statistics, but we need to know questions, the right questions to ask. So now we can ask questions related to their sessions, but before I open it to the floor, we have received uh, several questions from the audience throughout the day, so I'm going to read one of them, oh, sorry, uh, several of them to start the Q&A session. The first questions I want to read out is directed to uh, Selinda, and it's coming from Ms. Talia Rahma. Uh, the question is, can I just ask about sample size, urban and rural percentage? What's the proportion? Um, uh, really good question. So I am blanking. You guys run, I think it's like 60, 40. It's about a third rural. So the polls um, that DI has been running and they've gone back to the, um, to look at the census and, and all the other compiled data, is about a third of the voters rural, uh, two thirds urban. So, oh, I'm sorry. Two thirds uh, rural, uh, urban. Two thirds rural, one third urban, and uh, what that means, though, for any given sample, another key thing I think you want to think about is when you're looking at subgroup sizes. So if you if you see anybody report a subgroup number about a poll, so they say women felt this way, or rural people felt this way, or uh, redheaded people felt this way, uh, make sure that that subsample size is about 75 to 100 people. 
because the error rate on 100 people is plus or minus 10%. The error rate on 50 people is plus or minus 20%. So you want to make sure, if you want to get a number that's at least somewhat reliable, you want to look at a subgroup of no smaller than 75 or 100 people. So always look for that. The second thing I would say to you also that I was realizing as Glenn was talking, we in our polling would never rely on one question to determine uh, an answer. If you really want to get a reliable reading on something, like how do people feel about an economic message? How do people feel about the head of your party? How do people feel about, uh, do youth have a different agenda than older people do? You would look for the pattern across several questions. So by definition, we would never draw an overall strategic conclusion from just one question. Uh, we would look for a pattern, a consistent pattern of answers over a number of questions. Thank you, Sarinda. Uh, the next question uh, is directed to Mr. Kodari, and this came from Mr. Saif bin Ahmed. He, uh, Mr. Ahmed wants to know whether in Indonesia the government agency or intelligence agency have any prediction and how frequently it matches with your survey in terms of political results. Very interesting question. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I do not really know whether the government agencies conducted uh, so-called polling or, or, or surveys. Uh, certain uh, institution like the Bureau of Statistics, uh, of course, conduct uh, statistical uh, counting, but usually it is census. So census is uh, uh, getting data from the whole population, which is different from what we are doing. We are uh, attracting data from samples, only a part of the population. So I do not really know whether we are conducting that kind of survey. But uh, I think it's it's uh, very sensitive for the government using government uh, uh, apparatus and using government money to conduct uh, a political surface because it will create some kind of uh, uh, criticism or suspicious uh, suspicion from from uh, the opposition. So I think the government tend to uh, make a distance from such kind of activity. Uh, I, I know that uh, SBY, you know, you know, the current president, is a keen user, keen observer of public opinion. He become, he become the president because of the public opinion. <laughs> the elite did not support, did not, did not support, you know, you know, if the president was elected by the parliamentary, you know, you know, you know have very small, have a very small chance. He become the president because of the people. <laughs> he become the president. That's the power of, of, of the people. Of the, the people. So uh, he follows uh, uh, opinion polls regularly, but then he is using uh, data from private party. My institution used to be uh, one of the institution that provides opinion polls for SBY until he became very disappointed and smashed the table, like I told you <laughs> early this morning. Uh, after 2008, there was a kind of, uh, some kind of uh, uh, gap between, <laughs> between Kodal and, and Yudhoyono and SBY. Uh, but then uh, there are many other friends of mine who was waiting for my, my opinion polls and, and advice. So, uh, I think government does never, never oftenly, never oftenly uh, conduct survey using the state authorities. As for intelligence, uh, this is a very tricky question. Yeah, I don't know whether the current uh, intelligence body is using or conducting their own surveys, but uh, I think the intelligence in Indonesia are not that sophisticated. Yeah. They are the old-fashioned the old-fashioned uh, intelligence. So they put one person in one meeting and another person in another meeting to gather information. Uh, 
perhaps in this room there is also intelligence officer yeah. <laughs> reporting to the headquarters in Dhaka or, yeah, or, 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 or maybe there is intelligence from Indonesia listening to what Kodari says and <laughs> report to Jakarta that would be me yeah, yeah. that would be me yeah, maybe you, maybe you. <laughs> But I have a very interesting uh, experience, you know, uh, the first direct uh, presidential election held in 2000, uh, 2004. Uh, in 2003, we start to publish opinion polls regularly uh, and then widely uh, cited by the media because uh, the funding coming from Japan, so it was an open, uh, not a private uh, opinion polls, and we share the data with anyone who is interested. And then I was invited by the military intelligence. I was invited to speak and present the finding of Sophie in front of, I don't know, maybe the officers, because they were using uniforms. But I know for sure it was the intelligence office. So uh, when I present uh, the findings and the scenario ahead that was projected from, from, from the surveys, uh, somebody, somebody uh, who is sitting in the front, so I assume he has a uh, high ranking, uh, he, he, he was a ranking official, somebody with the mustache. Uh, you remind me of him, sir. <laughs> but we are uh, much handsome than he was. He uh, denied the finding of the survey. And he didn't believe what I said and what we said at the moment. He didn't believe that you know you're not good win the elections. Yeah, but well, I, I take it. Uh, uh, I open myself. I said I think maybe uh, he's not familiar. He does not believe, or he does not know uh, the Sufi methodology. So he denied. But later on, later on, <laughs> when you don't know uh, actually become the president, and I get along with uh, the circles friends of Yudhoyono, suddenly I met him. And it turns out to me that he is actually uh, one of the supporters of Yudhoyono. So I think he was playing tricks with me, or playing trick with his boss. So at the time, he denied the finding, uh, uh, maybe to show his boss that I'm not a supporter of Yudhoyono, but actually he is a supporter of Yudhoyono. That's my experience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Kadari. And no, I'm not intelligent, Indonesian intelligent. <laughs> so, the next question is, uh, unfortunately, there's no name, but there's initial here, S-A, uh, and if it was written in Bangla, hopefully the translation is accurate. It's directed to Dr. Salahuddin, and it's two-part questions. The first one is, why do you think there is a huge disagreement among the political parties in Bangladesh, and why media is not playing a constructive role to mitigate, to try to mitigate these problems. Be, be careful, there is intelligence. And by the way, what's your solution for the Well, it is a very difficult question. I mean, I'll try and I pretend to be smart enough to give that. The first thing I'll start with the very positive notion is that, well, uh, disagreement, or you call it huge disagreement as I said. I think this is in a democracy, it's the beauty of democracy. Well, any democracy is huge disagreement. I mean, this is part of the democratic process. But if it goes beyond the proportion size, then perhaps it's a question of uh, worry for us. Now, uh, for me, the main reasons are few people, to be a number of reasons. First, I believe that we really don't know uh, exactly what our broad national goals what we want to achieve. We must have some basic level of agreement on that. And of course we have some very common um, virtues and values that centers around our great liberation war. But <clears throat> dear on, onward, we haven't really explored that. This could be one that is. Next I believe that our political leaders especially two major parties, are more centering around and propagating the ideas about dream of our leaders. Now, when they talk about dream of our leaders, respective party have their own leader, 
And we really don't know exactly as citizens what these dreams are all about in a very opportune time. And if you really look into those, you'll find most probably that dream are not heterogeneous, they're more of common. But none of the political party leaders has really made it clear. Not the civil society, media, or the citizens says, well, the dream are more the same, so why you are really doing that? So most probably the dream of the national leaders has to be more specifically defined so that we don't really fight for those. And of course, there's a built-in mutual mistrust. And that mistrust is, again, not based on a strong ideological position. Most probably, that kind of thing comes up very naked and blunt during the electoral processes. <clears throat> Another issue that, uh, my point of view, is really bringing this disagreement is some basic debates and uh, questions of national interest has not been widely discussed. We have so many things that is, has, needs to be surfaced out and discussed, frankly speaking. We have some called, some things sort of unknown enemies we create and divide the nation. And this whole responsibility goes to our leadership. And finally, I believe that since we have got into the parliamentary system since the 90s, the parliament as the highest body hasn't been able to really play a very constructive role, including honorable speakers, those of the house chief. They have played more of a guardian role than they have more to play the role of partisan candidate. Now, <clears throat> if you look into the parliament debates, these are again not on substantive national issues which would bring the two parties together. And I would, in the precise term, most probably I would blame the honorable speakers respective parliaments. I haven't seen, at least evidence is not much there, where the Honourable the Guardian of the Parliament has taken a personal initiative to bring in. There has been some small moves, but most probably that has not been very vividly uh, <coughs> visible or we haven't seen much. Now, as regard the role of what role media could play in this litigation process, it's again very difficult for me to respond to. The fact remains that media in Bangladesh, to my assessment, is also suffering from some kind of an identity crisis. Which school or which party belong to? I mean, very honestly speaking, most of the people will perhaps say that, with the exception of course, uh, the media is, has, has their own political character. And I'm not surprised because this is perhaps also true in any mature democracy. Even in Western democracy, media is not really that apolitical, that political flavor. So naturally, media hasn't taken much of a strong initiative. Of course, lately, I must say, media has been doing some work in you know, organizing different workshop, roundtable, etc., to discuss about national issues. But they haven't taken. No, and I think they're responsible to take that, to really mitigate the whole process. But one thing is true that media is very much free in Bangladesh and they have really unearthed a lot of many uh, debates and issues for, um, for the nation to respond to. But having said that, as I said earlier, media is politicized. And media reports has also been questioned in terms of their objectivity. The same report, if you see a same incidents being reported by two or three different newspapers, they have simply two different models. That has also created a sort of faithlessness towards media uh, from the common perspective. And virtually media is seen to be more of a partisan role and to be blamed. That's what being the objection they make, with the exception of very few media. But finally, I believe that over the years, in Bangladesh context, media has played some role, at least in raising the question that for heaven's sake sit together. I mean, if you look into the recent trend, media have been reading this question. How much convicted, I mean, convinced, I mean, how much really deep demand is there, I don't know. But the fact is that media is not questioning that. But again, bottom line is that media is still divided, and people doesn't always believe what is being reported in the media. That's my personal view. 
and I'm sorry, uh, well, the media is very difficult to talk about, and uh, media can take you high up, and then you can really go down the drain. So, with that caution, note, I'm saying this is absolutely personal view. But of course, I believe media has been a distinctive role in Bangladesh context since our independence. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Salavi. And the next question is directed to Mr. Glenn Cowan. And this is a very good question for me as well, because I often ask this question. You know, after the completion of this conference, what we in this room can do so our leaders can start doing public opinion research and do what people want, comes from Mr. Mahmoud. So we, we have a uh, representative from political parties, uh, NGOs, research organizations. So what can we do to force, to, to encourage public uses of public opinion research? Well, I think the first thing is you have to decide whether you are better off treating the information uh, as proprietary, that you hold it. And you go to political leaders and present it to them for a private conversation. This is what we've discovered. This is how we did the work. This is what we've learned. And this is uh, now available to you in making your deliberations about public issues. The, the other perspective is to go public with the information to inform the media, to try to have it discussed broadly among the public and for the leaders of the country to learn it in that fashion. And there are arguments for both approaches. I think that the leaders of the country face the same problems with public opinion research that you do. They don't know what to trust. They, they read about, they hear about so many surveys and don't have any way to actually understand which of these surveys are valid and which are not. So I think in this instance, you might be better served, at least initially, before the major political contests begin, in using this information for private conversations so that you can better explain it, so you can have a conversation about it. Use it as an entry point to a conversation with political leaders. If we have something we'd like to show you, it is of value, and we would like to discuss it with you. It is uh, not to be made public. It is only for us to have internal discussions. You could not do that and then go public with it, because that would be a violation of trust. So one way around that problem might be to have certain questions which are for private conversation with political leaders and others which are more for public consumption. All right. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Uh, by the way, we're, we're broadcasting live through the internet, and we have about 170 viewers uh, viewing us online. And I'm going to check with my technical colleagues, if some, because they can ask questions too, if they do, please bring it to, uh, to me. In the meantime, any questions from the audience? I have two more here. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Momino Amin. Momino Amin. Uh, I'll just read this question. Uh, question to Ms. Selinda Lake. So, earlier you mentioned campaign message should be 300 second maximum. Is is that for video message or text? So, really good question. Um, so I said it should be 30 seconds max. Um, and by that I meant more the summary of your message. Uh, that that's about uh, what uh, people will, uh, you know, give you for a kind of summary message, somewhere between 30 seconds and a minute. Uh, and then people start to uh, focus on other things. Uh, also, the whole point is you can have your overall message and then you illustrate it. And you'll remember I said, so you have your overall message and you illustrate it with no more than three things. So we're just talking about what people pay attention to and what people um, can remember. 
Now that 30 seconds to a minute comes, that is the average length of a television advertisement. It is also the average length uh, that people will spend, uh, say, online before they decide to get off or not. It's, uh, you know, when we're even doing a survey, for example, uh, the average person decides on whether or not to do that survey in 45 seconds. So there are just, this is just the kind of attention span that people have, the amount of information that they can recall. One thing we didn't talk about is repeat, 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 repeat. Um, and, and when you ask, you know, when you have your message and your spouse and your, your kids are mocking you, your spouse can't stand it and says, if you say that one more time, I'm going to throttle you. And you, can bear, you get nauseous when you think about giving that speech. And then maybe you're penetrating that voter who isn't paying attention regularly, that undecided voter who's going to be less information, more divided, and not as engaged in politics as we are. So, 30, so it's more of a standard when you're practicing your message in front of the mirror, think about can you summarize that choice, that contrast, can you summarize what your candidacy or your party's message is in 30 seconds to a minute, and then can you illustrate in no more than three short sentences? Thank you. The, the next question, I think this is an open question to all the speakers. Uh, what are the ways, it com it's coming from Mr. Sakar Muhammad Ali. Uh, so the question is, what are the ways to overcome the terrorism and illegal power exercise of some politicians in order to modern modernize uh, political parties in Bangladesh? Okay, what are the ways to overcome the terrorism and illegal power exercise of some politicians so political parties in Bangladesh can modernize. Okay, so. Can I get it again? Please. Yes, please. So I think the question starts with a, an assumption that in uh, Bangladesh there are some political powers exercising terror or illegal means. So how, what can we do to stop that? So political parties can be modernized. Okay. Well, the second part, I mean, just to the first part. I mean, how can we address, or why some party and political parties are living terror? I mean, which politics? Now, <clears throat> well, I don't know exactly what he mean by terror. Uh, I would say violence is the right word for me. Because, and violence based. Now, the violence act in politics is not really very really, uh, common practice, but it's a very recent practice. Now, most likely, when you really reduce the space, open space for politics, that could really make some party more feel marginalized, they might. But culturally speaking, violence is something that Bangladeshi average would not accept. And this is not desired. And our history doesn't say that we have had violence much. Only for the last 10 years we have seen that. Most probably from a political science point of view, the space has to be open. And that most probably some section of society is feeling that this has been reduced. So as a, a student of political science, public administration, my, my way of looking into is that let's widen up the space and let there be debate. And in a democracy, the more you create space and debate, and the chances of violence to reduce or terror will go. At the same time, I believe that political parties, especially the major political parties, should take responsibility that to what extent they will tolerate uh, violence within their system. Because when you talk about violence, it is not precisely something that one single or a couple of parties are doing. It has become known as culture of showing your strength uh, by using these tools. So responsibility goes back to the political parties. They have to realize that it's their responsibility too. And the people, or else they will have to face the tune when the election process comes in. But unfortunately, the political leaders are increasingly believing that violent tools or terror could help them in getting the election process in their favor. Now, two ways this can be addressed. One, of course, I believe is an aggressive role to be played, or a positively aggressive role to be played by the media, both electronic and print media. 
and of course civil society and NGOs and others, they will have to be mobilized, people's opinion. And of course, third thing I believe that violence is always not that cheap. You have to really spend a lot of money for it. And the evidence are there is saying that violence has been sponsored and it is really it's not that easy to really make things about it. You have to put a lot of money for it. And I believe the government, the CIA and the media should also let it expose that where for the money is coming from. So all these things together I believe that violence or terrorism or whatever you call it now, uh, that really uh, has to be addressed with the increasing awareness, media pressure, civil society role and a clear understanding of the political parties that end of the day violence will not let them sustain for a longer period. Thank you. Mr. Kodari, would you like to share some of your experience on this case? Uh, I'll be very careful to talk about uh, Bangladeshi politics because uh, I'm making knowledge about it. So I'm just uh, telling you experience in English. Uh, there was uh, uh, election of local government in one district in central Kalimantan in Indonesia. Uh, the result of the voting was uh, completely different from finding from Sufi. So I was surprised. And then it turned out later that the case was brought to the judiciary, to the uh, constitutional court because all dispute related to election will be uh, settled by the Constitutional Court of Indonesia. <coughs> so it turns out uh, finally that the winning by, uh, by the, the, the winning side was caused by inter, uh, intimidation and money. So uh, a couple minutes ago, gentleman over there asked me, have you ever missed your prediction according to this on your survey? Yes, a number of times. So one of the reasons why is if anything else intervenes the opinion, which is first the money and second is the violence. And the impact will be uh, very big if the two are combined. Yeah. So in that district, the two, the two things are combined and then change the public of the result of the elections totally. But then uh, the victory was cancelled, cancelled by the by the judges, based on the findings that it is a violation of the law. So I think in order to contain the violence in politics, there must be a regulation that prohibiting the use of violence in politics, in intervening uh, public opinion. Uh, this example set a model for other candidates all over Indonesia. If you want, if you use violence in winning the elections, eventually the court will cancel it. So there is no advantage to use violence, to use the things that are part of the regulation. Second story, second uh, observation of mine. Politicians and political parties in Indonesia used to, uh, they are accustomed to use, to uh, uh, source, source capital, to, to waste during the election. First is the money, and uh, second is the muscle, yeah, money and muscle. So the one, have the bigger money, bigger amount of money, the one who have the stronger muscle is the one who win the elections. We try to uh, change the situation among others by, uh, by advising them to use money uh, in a proper ways. So when I have clients with money, I say to them, sir, you have money, but don't use the money to buy food. Do not give cash to the people in order to fulfill it. But use the money to conduct a winning strategy. So you have to conduct surveys, and then you have to craft it, uh, uh, the message, the suitable message. And then you have to 
socialized. You have to compare. In a democratic and civilized way, uh, civilized, civilized way. So you have to convert the use of money for buying goods into conducting a proper campaign. Uh, and in that case, I would say the need for advertising in the media is necessary. The need, let me repeat, the need for campaign advertising in the media is necessary. Because you have to create channels for affecting the people. There are many ways. Yeah. The traditional ways is to uh, give pressure to the people, to give money. But you have to open another way, more civilized, uh, a way of influencing the people. That is by campaigning. You cannot just campaign uh, from door to door, uh, using door to door campaign or uh, putting posters on the streets or uh, in the walls of the buildings. But you have to use television, you have to use uh, electronic media, you have to use social media. Uh, of course, it will need some amount of money, but I believe it, you can reach the bigger audience. And then it is also uh, accessible to anybody. The television campaign is easily understood, not only by people who have higher education, but people with no education, they can understand TV advertising. Uh, in, in the case of Indonesia, in the case of Indonesia, the media that reaches yeah, the whole population is television. That's all. Yeah. If you use radio, you only cover around 16 or 20 percent of the vote. It's television which can be seen by everybody in, in the country. So I urge, uh, or I suggest that you open other channels of influencing people. Do not strict, do not strict, do not limit your way of influencing the people, your way of getting votes by using only money or the muscle. You have to provide something that is that makes you uh, get away from those things that are... Seven minutes, so I think and we, we just received a few more questions. This one came from uh, Professor Masuda Rashid Chaudhry, and she's asking about, it's an open question to everybody, experience, uh, does gender, culture, religion, or social systems create differences in opinion? So, who wants to start? Maybe Sarita? Okay. Um, well, uh, certainly uh, in many, 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 many countries, uh, gender is a very important difference um, in opinions. Uh, sometimes it gets manifested politically, sometimes it doesn't. We talked earlier about the fact that uh, in a number of developing countries in particular, uh, women will sometimes take uh, their opinions on politics from the men in their lives, their fathers, their older brothers, their spouses. And that one of the campaign techniques in countries like that is to get in independent, independent information to women uh, to form their in their own channels. To